Lewis helps us to appreciate that apologetics need not take the form of deductive argument. Instead, apologetics can be an invitation to step into the Christian way of seeing things and explore how things look when seen from its standpoint. Lewis's approach says, try seeing things this way. If worldviews or meta narratives can be compared to lenses, which of them brings things into the sharpest focus? That is Alistair McGrath, the famous theologian, scientist, and professor at Oxford University, talking about C.S. Lewis. Over the years, I've developed a love for apologetics, reading books from John Lennox, Timothy Keller, Alistair McGrath, and many other Christian minds. But the one who stands above them all as a great intellectual giant is C.S. Lewis. In fact, his work helped shape the arguments posed by the authors I mentioned before. Today we are going to take a look at a section of his incredible book entitled Mere Christianity. Welcome to the Hacka Podcast. My name is Greg Hackathorn. I hope you all are doing well. It has been a while since I've flown solo on here, but I've been itching to share this book with you for quite some time. Before we get to it, though, I want to encourage you to share this episode with a friend or on social media and allow it to bless others. If you have time to rate and review the show, hopefully we've earned a five-star rating. I would greatly appreciate that as it provides me feedback and it makes it easier for new listeners to discover the show. We continue to grow and that is because of all of you. This was a great message we received recently and I wanted to share it with you all. The podcast has really helped me to see the humanity of the people you've interviewed and how I can relate to what I thought were just spiritual giants. I've really been encouraged in my faith by your work. I look forward to hearing you continue in this avenue of ministry. That was one of the goals of this podcast, to make ministry feel more relatable through their life stories, and we've been blessed by so many amazing guests on this podcast, and we're looking forward to many more. I'm just happy to hear that that has come across. Well, I'm excited to dive into mere Christianity with you, but before we do that, let's learn a little bit about the author of this amazing book, C.S. Lewis. Clive Staples Lewis, the author and theologian who is best known for a series of children's books he wrote called The Chronicles of Narnia, was born on the 29th of November, 1898, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Lewis was brought up in the Protestant Church of Ireland, but as a teenager, he lost his faith. He claimed it was due to boring church services and the problem of evil in the world. He lived as an atheist until late into his 20s. In 1916, Lewis was offered a scholarship at University College, Oxford University. But in 1917, his university life was interrupted as he volunteered to join the British Army in the First World War. He took part in trench warfare, experiencing the horrors of that ghastly war. In the final months of the war, he was injured by a shell and was sent home to recover from his injuries. After serving in France with the Somerset Light Infantry in World War I, he began his studies at Oxford and achieved an outstanding record, taking a double first in honors moderations, that was in Greek and Latin texts, and greats, classical history and philosophy and then staying on for an additional first in English language and literature, completing it in one year instead of the usual three. He became a fellow and tutor of Magdalen College, Oxford, in 1925, a position he held until 1954. It was during his time at Oxford that he formed close friendships with other Oxford fellows, such as J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, and Owen Barfield. They formed an informal group known as the Inklings. They would meet to read and discuss parts of their novels. In fact, Lewis encouraged Tolkien as he wrote his epic, The Lord of the Rings. He became increasingly interested in the question of the existence of God and Christianity. This was Lewis. After many evening chats with the Inklings, Lewis finally converted to theism in 1929 and became a Christian in 1931. Lewis later wrote that he felt like a reluctant convert, but he knew he had to accept the evidence of faith. C.S. Lewis became an influential apologist for Christianity, and he concentrated on a more universal form of Christianity. 
He rarely made any specific reference to a particular denomination, but sought to reinforce the underlying Christian values shared by all Christian faiths. And it was because of this approach that he was selected, it seems, in 1941 to give a series of four radio talks on the British Broadcasting Corporation about Christianity. Remember that this was following the Great War and during World War II. These talks that initially went out on the radio were later compiled into the book known as Mere Christianity. The book is broken up into four different sections corresponding with his talks, and today we will be looking at section two, What Christians Believe. We will be reading portions of his book as he builds his case on why Christians believe what they do believe, and then commenting on the different things that we will be reading. So we'll start here. People who all believe in God can be divided according to the sort of God they believe in. There are two very different ideas on this subject. One of them is the idea that he is beyond good and evil. We humans call one thing good and another thing bad, but according to some people that is merely our human point of view. These people would say that the wiser you become, the less you would want to call anything good or bad, and the more clearly you would see that everything is good in one way and bad in another, and that nothing could have been different. The other and opposite view is that God is quite definitely good or righteous, a God who takes sides, who loves love and hates hatred, who wants us to behave in one way and not in another. The first of these views, the one that thinks God is beyond good and evil, is called pantheism. It was held by the great Prussian philosopher Hegel, and, as far as I can understand them, by the Hindus. The other view is held by Jews, Mohammedans, and Christians. And with this big difference between pantheism and the Christian idea of God, there usually goes another. Pantheists usually believe that God, so to speak, animates the universe as you animate your body that the universe almost is God, so that if it did not exist, he would not exist either, and anything you find in the universe is part of God. The Christian idea is quite different. They think God invented and made the universe, like a man making a picture or composing a tune. A painter is not a picture, and he does not die if his picture is destroyed. So you see, Lewis lays out plainly how the Judeo-Christian view of God is different from every other religion. Even the modern form of mysticism that leads people to talk about the universe as something other than a creation or sending out thoughts and vibes. You can kind of hear that in today's culture and today's society in the way that people talk about the universe and, and uh, sending out good thoughts and sending out vibes. I talked about that on a previous podcast. What exactly is a vibe? But you can see that Lewis is actually addressing similar points of view, similar thoughts, all the way back in the 40s. Then he tackles what he considers the simplistic arguments that atheists put forward against God. He says, My argument against God was that, and he's talking about himself when he was an atheist, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such a violent reaction against it? A man feels wet when he falls into water, because man is not a water animal. A fish would not feel wet. Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust, not simply that it did not happen to please my fancies. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as, if there were no light in the universe, and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know that it was dark. 
dark would be a word without meaning. And this is what I always return to in discussions with atheists. The basis of the arguments against God tend to be moral ones, tend to be based on morality. But if God does not exist, where does your sense of morality come from? How are you able to uh, reason and believe that things are good and bad? Why do we talk about things being good and things being evil if none of that actually exists? You can't have it both ways. You can't say that this world is evil, therefore God doesn't exist. But by getting rid of God, your definition of evil is completely relative to you. Do you follow? If God doesn't exist, then your belief that something is evil is completely relative to your view on things. So then how can we punish people? How can we say that things are evil when, according to them, it may not be? You can't have it both ways. You can't have morality and deny the existence of God because without God, you wouldn't even know that morality existed. Lewis continues, Reality, in fact, is usually something you could not have guessed. That is one of the reasons that I believe Christianity. It is a religion you could not have guessed. If it offered us just the kind of universe we had always expected, I should feel we were making it up. But in fact, it is not the sort of thing anyone would have made up. It has just that queer twist about it that real things have. So let us leave behind all these boys' philosophies, these over-simple answers. The problem is not simple, and the answer is not going to be simple either. What is the problem? A universe that contains much that is obviously bad and apparently meaningless, but containing creatures like ourselves who know that it is bad and meaningless. He lays the problem bare in this passage, and the existence of the problem further solidifies Christianity as the best explanation in his mind. So now that Lewis has established the problem, now that he has established what the issue actually is, he moves on to explain how it is that Christianity addresses it. So he says, there's this, there's this issue, there's this evil in the world, and there's this idea that many things seem to be meaningless, or many actions seem to, be, seem to hold not much meaning. And yet, there are people in this world that understand that there is evil, and there are people that understand that there is meaning in the world, or that there should be meaning in the world. So how do we explain that? This is what Lewis says. He says, One of the things that surprised me when I first read the New Testament seriously was that it talked so much about a dark power in the universe, a mighty evil spirit who was held to be the power behind death and disease and sin. The difference is that Christianity thinks that this dark power was created by God and was good when he was created and went wrong. Christianity agrees with dualism that this universe is at war, but it does not think this is a war between independent powers. It thinks it is a civil war, a rebellion, and that we are living in a part of the universe occupied by the rebel. Enemy-occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. When you go to church, you are really listening in to the secret wireless from our friends. That is why the enemy is so anxious to prevent us from going. He does it by playing on our conceit and laziness and intellectual snobbery. I love that word picture, that there is a war going on, in this world between good and evil. Some might call it spiritual warfare. Unfortunately, the world is enemy-occupied territory, the God of this world, as the Bible calls it. But there is good news. The King, the Creator, has invaded it through the Incarnation, or in disguise, and has recruited us to fight on His behalf. Much of the problems that we face in this life are the result of what we call free will. And Lewis explains that. He says, God created things which had free will. That means creatures can go either wrong or right. 
Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free, but had no possibility of going wrong. I cannot. If a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of creatures that worked like machines would hardly be worth creating. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. Perhaps we feel inclined to disagree with him. But there is a difficulty about disagreeing with God. He is the source from which all your reasoning power comes. You cannot be right and he wrong any more than a stream can rise higher than its own source. When you are arguing against him, you are arguing against the very power that makes you able to argue at all. It is like cutting off the branch you are sitting on. If God thinks this state of war in the universe a price worth paying for free will, that is, for making a live world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it, it is worth paying. What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, could set up on their own as if they had created themselves, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside God, apart from God. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. Without the ability to choose, there can be no love. It's that simple. Without the tree in the garden, without the ability to follow God's word or follow our own desires, true love cannot exist. And Simeon Costa talked about this in our episode with him. He highlighted the tree in the garden and, and how life studies, the Bible study that, that he created, talks about that specifically, how that man had to have a choice, had to have free will in order for love to exist. And obviously that was God's desire, that his creation would choose to serve him, choose to love him, choose to follow God's will. The great deception that Adam and Eve fell for was that they could be happy without God that they could create happiness out of their own lusts and desires. Lewis rightly points out that mankind is still pursuing this fruitless venture to this very day. Thankfully, God didn't leave us in that condition, despite our choices. I love how Lewis introduces Jesus into this moral conundrum. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. One part of the claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we have heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean the claim to forgive sins, any sins. Now unless the speaker is God, this is really so preposterous as to be comic. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself, you tread on my toes and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would simply imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. 
that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And sometimes we forget how revolutionary Jesus truly was, because many of us have been immersed in a society that believes in him and has been shaped by his teachings. But make no mistake, his claims were absolutely scandalous. And I love how Lewis points that out, especially in talking about forgiving sins. Currently, I'm doing a Bible plan that has me reading through the entire New Testament in 26 days. Reading through the Gospels in large chunks across a week has really helped me to see the life of Jesus in a fresh way. You know, you can read the Bible so many times in so many different ways, but reading the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John back to back to back all across a week or two has really helped me to see Jesus in a new light. You see, this man rocked first century Jerusalem. I mean, absolutely turned it upside down. He was touching lepers. He was casting out devils. He was healing on the Sabbath consistently. Like he didn't care that people kept complaining about it. He kept doing it. He was forgiving sins, raising the dead, challenging ideas and rules that had been followed for centuries, constantly debating the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. Jesus was not some moral teacher or some good guy preaching about peace and love. Anyone who says that has not seriously read the Gospels, has not seriously read the words of Jesus, the red letters in your Gospels. As Lewis said, he was either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Those are the only options. He didn't give any other options. He didn't come across as some great moral teacher all by himself. No. When you read the story of Jesus in totality, when you listen to his teaching, when you read the words of our Lord, it is either he was a liar, he made the whole thing up, he was absolutely insane, or he was and is who he said he is, the Lord of glory. He is Lord. Obviously, we all believe that, that he is Lord. We take that by faith. And his death was the inflection point of all of human history. Lewis explains this. We believe that the death of Christ is just that point in history at which something absolutely unimaginable from outside shows through into our own world. And if we cannot picture even the atoms of which our own world is built, of course we are not going to be able to picture this. Indeed, if we found that we could fully understand it, that very fact would show it was not what we profess it to be. The inconceivable, the uncreated, the thing from beyond nature, striking down into nature like lightning. You may ask what good it will be to us if we do not understand it. But that is easily answered. A man can eat his dinner without understanding exactly how food nourishes him. A man can accept what Christ has done without knowing how it works. Indeed, he certainly would not know how it works until he has accepted it. We are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins and that by dying he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. The gospel is so simple. It is the good news that Jesus died for our sins, and that we can have eternal life through him. That's it. That's the gospel. We don't have to overcomplicate it. The good news is that Jesus died for our sins, and that we can have eternal life through him. Lewis then tackles the importance of repentance. And this is probably my favorite passage from this book. It's probably my favorite quote of C.S. Lewis. It's just amazing. Now, what was the sort of hole man had got himself into? He had tried to set up on his own, to behave as if he belonged to himself. In other words, fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. 
laying down your arms, surrendering, saying you're sorry, realizing that you have been on the wrong track, and getting ready to start life over again from the ground floor. That is the only way out of our hole. This process of surrender, this movement full speed astern, is what Christians call repentance. We love and reason because God loves and reasons and holds our hand while we do it. Now, if we had not fallen, that would be all plain sailing. But unfortunately, we now need God's help in order to do something which God, in His own nature, never does at all. To surrender, to suffer, to submit, to die. Nothing in God's nature corresponds to this process at all. So that the one road for which we now need God's leadership most of all is a road God, in His own nature, has never walked. God can share only what He has. This thing, in His own nature, He has not. But supposing God became a man, suppose our human nature which can suffer and die was amalgamated with God's nature in one person, then that person could help us. He could surrender His will and suffer and die because He was man and He could do it perfectly because He was God. You and I can go through this process only if God does it in us, but God can only do it if He becomes man. Think about how beautiful that description is. We were so lost in sin, without the ability to overcome it, and we were in desperate need of God's help. But we needed help with something that God Himself had never experienced. He had never needed to surrender or to submit His will to another. He hadn't experienced suffering or death. And yet that is what repentance is all about. Surrendering ourselves to God. Submitting our will to His will. That is why the Incarnation was absolutely vital. Peter describes it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21-25. to 25. He says, For you have all been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Because Jesus gave us an example, because the sinless one died for sinful humanity, bearing our sins on the cross. We can turn from sin and return to God. We can overcome. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to finish up this episode with one final passage from Mere Christianity. I hope that you have gotten something out of it, and I would encourage you to read the book, buy the book if you can. Uh, you can get it on Audible as well if, you, if you'd rather listen to it. But I only covered one section of, of this amazing book, and I think if you're going to get into discussions that might involve some sort of apologetics or anything like that, I believe that this book is absolutely essential for your library. I encourage you all to read it. I think it's fitting to conclude here, where Lewis describes the second coming of Christ in a way that only he can. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society to undermine the devil. Why is he not landing in force, invading it? Is it that he is not strong enough? Well, Christians think he is going to land in force. We do not know when. But we can guess why he is delaying. He wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks on the stage, the play is over. God is going to invade all right. But what is the good of saying you are on his side then, when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream, and something else, something it never entered in your head to conceive, comes crashing in. Something so beautiful to some of us, and so terrible to others, 
that none of us will have any choice left. For this time, it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it becomes impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it.